Hello, and welcome to Reimagining Love. I'm Dr. Alexandra Solomon. Relationships have the power to wound us and the power to heal us. As a clinical psychologist, author, and professor at Northwestern University, I've devoted my life to studying intimate partnerships and family dynamics. On Reimagining Love, I'm here to translate complex clinical topics into tools and takeaways that you can use in your relationships today. If you're ready to develop relational self-awareness and create vibrant and loving relationships with the people who matter most to you, you've come to the right place. I'm so glad that you're here. Hi, Reimagining Love listeners. I have a special announcement. The brand new Reimagining Love Workbook, Volume 1, is now on sale on my website. You know, when I set out to create this podcast, I knew that I wanted the lessons and the insights from the episodes to feel tangible and immediately applicable to you and your relationships. As a couples therapist, I've seen time and time again that improving your relationships and your relationship with yourself takes effort and intention and time. We need strategies, we need practices that we can play with, as well as structured spaces to reflect. And sometimes the best way to do this is to put pen to paper, to see what's going on inside of our minds and inside of our hearts. So I decided that I would create companion worksheets for all of the solo deep dive episodes of Reimagining Love. These worksheets contain tables to fill out, relational self-awareness questions to answer, and reflection exercises, all tied to the topic of the episode. And these worksheets have been available to listeners through my newsletter as the corresponding episodes have aired. And now I've updated all of them and we've compiled them into this downloadable, easy to use workbook so that you can conveniently access them all in one place. And At the end of the workbook, you're going to find a glossary of the therapeutic terms that I frequently use, as well as a list of all the podcast episodes thus far organized by topic in case you're seeking support in a particular area at a particular moment. So if you're ready to dive deeper into your relational self-awareness work, click the link in the show notes or head to dralexandrasolomon.com slash RL Workbook to purchase this amazing bundle of resources, which you can use individually or with your partner. Welcome back to Reimagining Love. I hope that your week is off to a great start. Today, I'm really excited to have my friend Alicia Munoz on the show to talk all about overthinking your relationship. It is very hard for me to think of a more relatable topic than this one, especially for our community of Reimagining Love listeners. And Alicia is the perfect guest to talk us through this common pattern. Alicia Munoz is a certified couples therapist and author of four books, including Stop Overthinking Your Relationship, Break the Cycle of Anxious Rumination to Nurture Love, Trust, and Connection with Your Partner. Munoz currently works as a senior writer at Psychotherapy Networker. As many of you know, Psychotherapy Networker is my professional home away from home, a place where I do so much of my clinical education and my clinical writing. So this means that Alicia is a treasured member of my professional family, for sure. Okay, so in this conversation, Alicia is leading us through the essential tools that can help us break free from cycles of overthinking and rumination because... When the stories we tell ourselves about our relationships and our partners are neither true nor compassionate, it can stir up quite a bit of trouble. You're going to hear about her acronym, SLOW, which is a strategy to break free from rumination, and you're going to learn so many other strategies that I know you're going to be able to implement right away. And we have a great listener question that we explore together. Without further ado, here is my conversation with Alicia. Alicia, hello. Thank you for being here with me today. 
It's great to be here with you, Alexandra. You know, you and I met each other through, I think, both of our favorite, favorite, favorite professional home, which is Psychotherapy Networker, which is a conference I've been teaching at for many years, a conference in a community that's near and dear to your heart, and one where you've just taken on a really integral role as senior writer. So I... I'm so grateful for Networker always, but especially today because it, it brought me to you. Hmm, thank you. Yeah, I'm remembering that Livia Kent, who's the editor-in-chief, told me about you when I was looking for somebody to blurb one of my books. And she was like, oh, you have to reach out to Alexandra. And I did. And we spoke and discovered that we have a lot in common. Yeah, we've had just fun phone dates where we're kind of breaking down, you know, all the different roles of partner and mother and, you know, (laughs) therapist and writer and how we navigate all of that. I know you are definitely somebody that I hold near and dear and, and feel able to turn to about all these opportunities we have and how to make them all kind of flow together. So, Mm, Thank you. Well, I was especially thrilled when your book, Taking Sexy Back, came out. I feel like Uh, women embracing their sovereignty is such an important part of of not just mental health and relationships, but also of sort of creating a new consciousness in society. So I really, really loved your book. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. So speaking of books, before we dive in and talk about your book, I want to ask you the relational self-awareness question that we ask all of the guest experts who are here on Reimagining Love. Are you ready for the question? I'm ready. Bring it on. Okay. So Alicia, what is the growing edge that you are currently working on in one of your important relationships? And what has it been teaching you lately? So I thought a lot about this question and kind of kept trying to come up with super smart answers for it. But then I I found myself coming back again and again to this very simple answer, which is that I'm working on being more loving toward my husband. And I hesitated to share that with you and and your community because, first of all, I'm a couples counselor. So presumably, at least in my own inner critic world, you know, I should have being loving toward my husband down after, you know, 17 years that we've been together. But the second reason that I hesitated was because it's so easy to misinterpret that, you know, and I think there's so much pressure on partners. And I would venture to say that especially women partners to please, to be kind, to be good, to be caretakers, you know, to sort of center their relationship around being loving. So I think this needs a little unpacking and you're the perfect person to do it with. Um, You know, being loving for me really with him is actually about creating space to align with my values. And I find that, you know, as I get busier, uh, as I take on more responsibilities and continue on this journey with this man that I know very well, it's easier and easier to kind of let the culture bleed into my life to where I'm focusing on goals. I'm looking for the next achievement. You know, I'm, everything's more important in a sense than pausing, breathing, connecting to my body, acknowledging that there is this other human being. He happens to be a man, you know, who I'm living with, who is important to me and who, even though I think I know him inside out, I don't, you know, And even though I think I know myself inside out, I also don't because every moment is different, you know, and every moment we're changing, we're growing. And as we get older, there's more and more to grieve, to acknowledge, to celebrate. So, you know, being more loving is my growth edge. And I think it'll continue to be. Yeah. There's a lot there that just lands right in my heart. I mean, even just as simple as like, Last night, like my husband and I try to go for a walk, you know, after dinner, and I could think of a hundred reasons not to. I hadn't written an Instagram post. I hadn't prepped enough for our conversation. I hadn't, I hadn't, I hadn't. And I really had to slow down, which we'll talk about your process for how you invite us to slow down. 
And right, remember that I think I have a really similar growing edge around being loving and that it, yeah, it, that it is the, the culture. I mean, that way, the way you say the culture seeping in, right? The culture seeps in and those little shiny objects of the goal and the achievement and the post and who's going to like the post, those are so much more tangible and such a stronger hit of dopamine or whatever the hell than a walk around the block with my husband. I am grateful that I caught it, right? I noticed it. I caught it. I made the shift. We went for a walk. It, I felt my heart open, my chest open. But boy, oh boy, there are times where I don't catch it and make that pivot and I just get sucked in. So I'm really glad that you are sharing with us your growing edge because I think it's going to certainly resonate for me. Certainly. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I could definitely relate to that. I I have a slightly different story, but I was in my office. It was five o'clock, you know, supposedly at five o'clock, I stopped working and transition into, into my family life. And I heard him come downstairs. He knocked on the door and he, he sort of did everything I've talked to him about doing. You know, he said, can I talk to you for a moment, asking permission, not just kind of coming in and, and speaking. And, you know, I could notice from his body language that he was tense, that there was some tension in his body. So immediately there's tension in my body and all kinds of stories and narratives that I'm making up in my mind. You know, what does he need from me? What did I do wrong? You know, what does he, you know, expect me to solve? You know, whatever stories were there. And, but I had to actually breathe and take a breath and just say, okay, he asked for permission. And so I said, okay, I'm here. And then he proceeded to share an anxiety, a health anxiety. And immediately I could tell I was going into, he's over-exaggerating this, you know, this is, this, he's making this up, he's hypochondriac. And so even though I'd caught it, you caught it with your partner and pivoted and went on the walk. It's like, I could see what was happening, but it was a little bit like watching, you know, a, a train wreck in slow motion. I was just like, I had the awareness. I knew I was, I was shutting down. I was judging. I was. Uh, pushing him away, you know, and it still happened. And it, and he, and he ended by saying, you know, you're making me feel like I'm crazy for sharing this fear of mine. And, um, and he left the room. And so, you know, sometimes even with all this awareness, it still happens. And, and then what we're left with, if we're going to take that growing edge of, of being more loving, of aligning with your values, of making time and space for your partner, for intimacy, which is all countercultural, then what we have left is this idea of how do we repair? Yeah. Do you, how do you feel about talking to us a little bit about how you repaired? Because I think, you know, you, you literally wrote the book on stop overthinking. And so, you know, in generously sharing with us this example, you are reminding us we, okay, we can learn this. And your book is the guide to help us notice what you exactly just talked us through. Our partner approaches us there's a relational field between us. Our reaction shifts their reaction. You, know, you, you break that all down in the book. And so even knowing that, and sometimes we will notice it and be able to make a shift. And sometimes it is that train, you know, watching the train wreck in slow motion. And then all we have left is repair. So do you, how would you feel about telling us a little bit about the repair? Yeah. The situation I just told you about happened relatively smoothly, you know, in the sense that I guess part of it was smooth. So for me personally, and I guess everybody's a little different, the hardest part is tuning in and feeling my own shame. I spend years, I spend weeks, I spend days, I spend hours holding clients, teaching clients to make space for each other, to be present for each other, to be non-judgmental, you know, to show up courageously. And I literally just went against all of that you know, and, and then the shame that comes up and be like, okay, this is guiding me toward repair. That's what happened for me. And I guess I'm blessed in the sense that my husband doesn't hold a grudge very long. So, so even just saying to him, you know, wow, you know, I'm, I'm sorry, I wasn't there for you. He was like, oh, okay, I get it. You know, but there are a lot of ways to approach repair. And I I haven't gotten around to having a deeper dialogue with him about that moment, that particular back and forth that we had, but I'm hoping to have a conversation with him about it soon. And what I suspect is going to come up is stuff related to 
you know, mortality, fragility, the ways that he's trying to cope with the loss of a friend, you know, you know, my own tendency to, to deny mortality and fragility in my life. And, you know, the, the pain of, of feeling helpless when your body doesn't act the way you want it to, and you feel, you feel older. So there are all these different steps along the route to repair where you can kind of move in and catch your overthinking, notice that it's happening, see that it's happening. And then, you know, in in my book, I talk a lot about, I give the process of slow, which is, you know, seeing the rumination, labeling the patterns, opening to the underlying feelings and welcoming those feelings that come. For me, it was shame. I had to kind of welcome shame. Um, And usually that process in itself is a way of kind of integrating parts of yourself that you're not proud of and accepting those. When you can do that, it's a lot easier to show up and communicate with another person, you know, to kind of let them know a little bit about your inner inner world. Yeah, right. And it's the sort of like the top tier, the top layer of the repair is you owning, acknowledging, and apologizing he met you there by not holding a grudge. And that sows, plants the seeds then for a really curious conversation about mortality, fragility, all of what you listed, which by the way, is another reminder of why we can never possibly know our partners is that 17 years ago, the two of you wouldn't have had that conversation because that wouldn't have been developmentally what was your own kind of individual, personal tender spot, right? 17 years ago, it would have been something about who, who knows, achievement or, you know, place in the world or whatever. So it's, it's, you know, as we continue to grow, that's the other, right? We have to keep, we get to keep knowing ourselves and our partners again and again. So Alicia, I want to like back all the way up for our listeners and talk about, so your book is called Stop Overthinking Your Relationship. Break the cycle of anxious rumination to nurture love, trust, and connection with your partner. So let me, I want to read um, something from the introduction. Is that okay? Yeah. Just for a moment. Because you spell out, so you you give us, like, I want to make sure that we really operationalize what does rumination mean? Like, what are you talking about when you're talking about rumination? So in the introduction of the book, you say, when your partner comes home late, you think, they're neglecting me. Work is more important than I am. If your partner doesn't initiate lovemaking, you think we're on our way to a sexless marriage. I knew this would happen. If your partner is distracted at the dinner table, you think they're bored. They have nothing to say to me. I can't believe it's come to this. If they forget to ask you a follow-up question after a doctor's visit, you think they're selfish and insensitive. I'm alone in this relationship. So can you explain to us what's happening in each of those examples? Like what is overthinking? So overthinking, I like to think of it as a mind altering substance. <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's sort of like the shot of whiskey, the, the shopping link that you go to, you know, the, the vape cartridge you reach for. It's except that it's always there. It's always accessible. It's always available to you. And not only that, you don't even know you're doing it most of the time. So it's a way that we react or respond to vulnerable emotions, impulses, sensations, inner experiences that we want to avoid because they're uncomfortable. And when it becomes out of control, then it kind of gets even more deeply entrenched within you as a way of coping. And one of the points you make very early on is that we come by this tendency to overthinking real understandably, that we are taught to value thinking over openness to experience. There's a cultural component here and that we are taught that culturally we view thinking as our most important human asset. So what is the problem with that? What is the problem with thinking that thinking is our most important human asset? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it's kind of like this double-edged sword because on the one hand, thinking is is so valuable and and there are all these healthy ways that we think, you know, whether, you know, it's it's problem solving or how we use metacognition to observe 
our own mental patterns and make different choices. But the cultural enshrinement and sort of deification of rationality and thinking, it's kind of on steroids at this point with social media. And um, I mean, maybe it always has been, but, you know, different in, through different forms. But it ends up marginalizing presence and awareness and uncertainty and being in the moment and wonder, awe, just the the experience of being human and not knowing, which is the foundation of any kind of intimate connection with other people. It's this ability to to be present and not know, not know what you're going to say, what they're going to say, you know, to kind of be curious about your own feelings. You know, I mean, right here, I'm with you. I don't know what you're going to say. I don't know exactly what you're feeling, but I see you moving. I see your face. Uh You know, I feel excitement in my belly and my chest. So it's like, it's an exciting experience to be here with you, not knowing as we speak, as we, you know, do this in the context of your listeners. And if we're just thinking, which I do a lot, you know, I came prepared for this talk. I have pages of things I thought about right here. (laughs) But if I start to read you what I wrote, because that's where I feel safe and that's where I feel like I know everything, this will be a very dead conversation. Oh, it's, yeah. The thing that you also help us get is that there's a relational impact. So overthinking happens inside of me. And it's something that I do to cope with the vulnerability of presence, the vulnerability of not knowing, and it plays out in what you call the relational field, which is the space between myself and my partner, myself and and whomever. So can you help us like understand that, like the transition from something that's very much internal, my own chatter, my own coping strategy, and the relational impact, the the where it goes in the space between myself and somebody else? Mm, sure. And just like raise your hand or make a time up out signal if I start getting too like, you know, woo woo or too mystical, because <laughs> I, I have a tendency to, to wax poetic on this, this topic. The relational field is not visible. It's palpable. It's something that you experience. So when I have thoughts about my husband being a hypochondriac, when he walks in the room to share an anxiety he has about his health. That thought affects my physiology. It affects my facial expression. It affects my tone of voice. You know, it constricts muscles in my chest um, and has all kinds of other physiological effects that I don't know because I'm not a doctor. But it's something then that he sees and feels and his body then responds and reacts. And then I'm in this sort of feedback loop, picking up on his reactions to my reactions to my own thinking. And then his thinking is creating new reactions that, you know, kind of get us in this vicious cycle where the relational field, the relationship field is the space of interconnectivity. And it's, you know, whether you believe it or not, whether you can prove it or not, It's worth observing what happens when you catch your rumination, label it, begin to open to your own experiences in the moment, and begin to accept and welcome more of who you are beyond your thinking. Because if you begin to do that with your partner, you'll see evidence that it changes how they react and respond to you. So in the book, I compare it to the difference between riding a unicycle, which is kind of like your own overthinking, and riding a tandem bicycle, which is sort of what we do in a relationship with our partner. Because if we sort of don't pedal or we take a quick swerve or, you know, or we hit a ditch, it's not just going to impact us. It's going to impact the whole relationship. It's not easy. 
you know, you thank goodness you are as gentle a writer as you are, because what you're asking us to do is very difficult, right? It's a kind of responsibility and accountability that is countercultural, right? So much easier to kind of point our finger and be like, yeah, but my partner, yeah, but my partner, yeah, but they didn't. Yeah, but if they hadn't, then I wouldn't have. You are really gently inviting us to notice our own, the shifts that happen based on the the thoughts we have, the stories we start to make up inside of our own minds and how powerful that is. I think for some of us who maybe grew up in a family of origin where we felt deeply unseen, it can be really, really hard to even get that idea that anything that I do with my body, with my face, with my voice impacts somebody else because I spent the first X number of years of my life feeling like nobody saw me anyways. And so that right there is an enormous shift just to start to get curious about what happens inside of you and how your your partner does see it. Your partner senses it. Your partner gets it. And that changes. It's like you're pairing responsibility with empowerment because it can evoke some shame or some fear or some yeah, but (laughs) while also then becoming incredibly empowering. Because if that's the power of my thoughts is they can take us in that direction, then what other directions could they take us in that would create different dynamics between us? Mm, I hadn't really thought of that issue of how when you're neglected growing up or you feel invisible or you feel unseen or you feel like people are projecting some sort of uh, false self onto you that then you have to live up to, you know, that can then create this self-doubt, you know, this way where, you know, you don't really trust the impact that you have, the power that you have, the impact that your thoughts have on you, on your relationship field, on your partner. You know, it is hard. And and it's never linear with this work. It's it's more like, you know, like a spokes on a wheel, a three-dimensional wheel, where the more that you begin to take time, take space to notice your own thinking and acknowledge that it has an impact. In a lot of ways, you're also beginning to heal that sense of not having value or only being here as an extension of another person's needs, you know, because, you know, you're, you're really putting your own attention on the internal workings of your mind, your body, your emotions, you know, your coping strategies. That process is saying, I matter a lot. I matter so much that I deserve gentle, persistent inquiry into my own processes. My processes matter. Yeah. That's beautiful. Gentle, (laughs) persistent inquiry into my own processes. Oh my God. Okay. So is relational rumination a symptom of relationship unhappiness or a cause of relationship unhappiness? Mm. So I think different people would have different answers to this, but I think it's both. I have an index card here handy and there's, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, actually it's the wrong index (laughs) card, forget it. Um, So anyway, there, okay. There was, there was was a research Something happened along the way. (laughs) There was something (laughs) along the way there that, that, you know, looked into that question and what they discovered, I think it was a study in England, was that, you know, that it's both. Like it, it both can contribute to mental health issues and it can also precede mental health issues. So, you know, whether you get it coming or going, it's important to, to kind of slow down, take a breath and begin to to notice, you know, how much am I letting this fog of overthinking color my life and my experience? Did I answer your question? You did. And maybe as you're saying, I think maybe it doesn't, right. Maybe it doesn't matter because even like, I'm thinking about the listener who wants to, you know, call you up right now and be like, okay, but Alicia, here's the deal. (laughs) My partner literally is doing things that are damaging to our relationship. Like they are doing things that are whatever, hurtful or insensitive. So I want to also talk about that, but it's like, even if they are, because of course they are, because your partner is as imperfect as you are, even if they are, 
sort of cleaning up your side of the street, meaning like beginning to unpack and work with your own ruminative processes, that will help you get clearer on what the ask is, what the shift is, what you need differently around relational agreements. So it's like, it's sort of a moot point whether you are ruminating because you're unhappy or whether your rumination is creating unhappiness. It's a moot point because no matter what, your own, what do we call it? Gentle, persistent inquiry into your processes is going to help you start to sift out what's yours, what's theirs. Where do we go from here? What conversations are we not able to have because of this fog? Yeah. I mean, I I don't think I can say it better than you just did, but I'm just going to reinforce for, for any listeners that are, you know, hearing this as a way to kind of tolerate intolerable situations or, you know, enable uh, clients who are being hurtful or disrespectful or devaluing. That's not what this is. That, you know, to any kind of persistent self-inquiry and and development of, of deeper understanding is really of yourself, is about learning to access the data that your emotions hold so that the choices that you make are aligned with your true needs, your true needs for, for safety, for healthy boundaries, you know, for, for closeness. And you might find that one person might do the work and begin to kind of get to the root of the feelings, the issues, the sensations, the past trauma, whatever it is that their rumination is blocking. And that might help them deepen in their relationship and get closer and commit in a way that they weren't able to before. And for another person doing that work, it might help them to to make a tough decision about, you know, moving out of this relationship and risking being alone and, you know, tolerating loneliness so that they are in a safer space. Yep, got it. Okay, there's two more things I want to talk through and then I and I think we're going to bring it then bring it all home with the listener question. <laughs> so, I wanted you to just kind of like tease apart. So, you talk about five kinds of relationship rumination. Like five these kind of basically five buckets of if we're catching ourselves ruminating, these are kind of the five categories the rumination might be. And I wanted to just have you flesh those out because I think it will help listeners like really land this idea of like, what is rumination? So you talk about blame, control, doubt, worry, self-pity. Those are the five types of rumination. So can you talk a bit, like, let's, can we just go through them even just briefly? What is blame? And then you, you also offer us like kind of the psychological, you call it a psychological nutrient for each. So for blame, it is like, focusing on like the finger pointing and whose fault it is, right? So what would you say about kind of how does blame show up in our ruminations? So blame is sort of twofold. You can sense when you're in a blame rumination cycle, often because there's this energy of attack. There's this energy of fault finding. And it will be directed toward another person or a situation or it will be directed towards yourself. So that's kind of how you can identify it. Usually it comes in the form of, why did they do that? They shouldn't have done that. That was so terrible. They're so terrible. Or I'm so terrible. I'm so dumb. I'm so thoughtless. Why am I like this? So that's how it sounds and how it feels, is that sense of just sort of aggression and intolerance toward yourself or another person. And the psychological nutrient you say there is acceptance acceptance because whatever the thing is has already happened control yeah so i mean control and and as your listeners are, are hearing this you know maybe just do a scan in your body and see if any of these resonate for you as as ones that you do frequently so control is where you're really constantly thinking about how to create a particular specific outcome so it tends to be rigid. It tends to be, um, th- there's a sense of urgency. This has to go this way. This has to go a certain way. I won't tolerate things if they happen differently. And when it's directed at other people, you're trying to shape you know, other people's behaviors. If you're a parent, 
you're probably really familiar with the control cycle, particularly as parents, even as pet parents, you know, you really want to protect other, you know, this other being. So often your mind is is thinking about, okay, well, if they do X, Y, Z, then we'll be good. They'll be good. Yep. I had this one last night on the very same walk we were talking about before. One of the things that Todd and I needed to talk about was, you know, something pertaining to our son and going into the conversation. I was so aware of the outcome that I wanted, you know, and my whole presentation was around how can I control Todd's, you know, response and get, how am I going to get him to want the thing that I want? And I, thank goodness, was working on your book and was like, oh, I know what this is. <laughs> and so I did what the psychological nutrient here is let go of perfectionism and what is out of your control. So I just, I really focused on like, just, and it was all these muscles in my chest and just softening them and really knowing that I'm going to listen to his, Todd's perspective on what needs to happen with our son because, you know, he's proven only a gazillion times over 20 years of raising this guy that he's got a pretty good handle, you know, on what's necessary. I don't have to do it all myself. Right, 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 Uh right. Beautiful. Okay. Doubt. There's never enough. So doubt sounds like there's never enough certainty. What if? Is doubt the what ifs? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So doubt is the what ifs. Doubt may align with that profile you just described of the person who hasn't been seen, who's been neglected, who doesn't feel like they have value, whose voice hasn't been heard. Doubt is just this, I I think of it as gaslighting yourself. So, you know, you're constantly second guessing your instincts, your intuition, you know, your body's kind of reactions, your own inner guidance. And you're looking externally for, you know, an authority to tell you what you feel, what you think, what you should do, how you should act. It just undermines your ability to make powerful choices in service of your own wellness. Good. And psychological nutrient there is expanding our ability to trust. Trust ourselves, trust forces we can't even see or know. What is, say more about the antidote to trust, please. I mean, sorry, the antidote to doubt. Sorry, antidote to doubt. To doubt, yeah. I mean, I, I think you described it well. It's cultivating, it's a process. You know, it, it's, it's gradually in community, ideally in community, where you have this countercultural community that affirms your own feelings, your own impulses, your own fears, your own needs, your own desires in a way that helps you to kind of align with your own core. Trust, it's a process. Yeah. Okay. The fourth one is worry, playing out worst case scenarios. Yeah. Yeah. Worry. I think it emerges from this existential reality that we really can't know what's going to happen in the next moment. So, I mean, some, I think trauma, early trauma, if you've experienced that, or if you've grown up without sort of the experience of, of a hand at your back, it's very easy for this rumination cycle to become your go-to form of overthinking because it's easy to think that, well, my own thinking is what's kept me safe all these years. You know, my own worrying, you know, my own uh, ability to imagine 10,000 ways that life could, you know, go wrong or, or hurt me. Yeah. What was the antidote to that one? I can't even remember. You'll have to tell me. Connecting, connecting with your body right here, right now, because right here, right now, I am safe right here, right now. I'm in this conversation. Like, yes, I have no idea what's going to happen next, but right here, right now, there is safety. There is ease, right? So it's that mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The last one is self-pity. This, I'm a powerless victim. Oof. I can sometimes throw the grandest of pity parties for myself. <laughs> Nobody ever attends. It's just me. I know, doesn't it suck? <laughs> Nobody shows up for those. Nobody wants to be there. I mean, sometimes a friend will be with me. You know, sometimes you can get a friend to join you for a little while, but a good friend is like, okay, good. So now what? <laughs> yeah. So no. Yeah. Okay. So tell us about self-pity. How is that reflected in our relationship ruminations? Yeah. So I know this one well. This is one of my favorites. It emerges out of this idea that life should be fair. And people should, really should, you know, people should treat me a certain way. My partner, 
you know, should be uh, more present. My partner shouldn't be a hypochondriac. You know, my partner, you know, should think the way I think or want the things I want. You know, the thing with self-pity is that it kind of feels good because you get to be right. You get to be the one who knows. And I think of it as a kind of disguised attempt to elicit rescue. You know, if you're in distress, if you're not getting what you need and you feel very sorry for yourself and you make it very visible and audible or even just passively, you know, kind of demonstrate that you know, you're not getting what you need. You're really just crying out for connection. You you're want your partner to meet you, but it doesn't work. You know, it, it doesn't work. And it's funny, my, my son and I have this practice that we've learned to engage in where we'll just, because we, you know, we all, all human beings, we all slip into self-pity rumination cycles. And my son will say, you know, mom, I'm feeling really sorry for myself right now, you know? I had a really, I had a beef with a friend at school, you know, things didn't go well. My teacher wasn't nice to me and I'm feeling really sorry for myself. And then I'll just say, poor you, you know, not condescendingly or, but just like, poor you, that's so, that's so bad. I'm so, I feel so sorry for you, you know, and he'll do it for me as well. I'll say, I'm feeling very sorry for myself and he'll say, poor you, poor you. And then it kind of vanishes, goes away, you know, because you've kind of let yourself indulge it openly with another person and it's not something to be ashamed of. But with rumination cycles that are self-pitying, the key really is to see what you're doing, to see that you're feeling sorry for yourself and kind of own it. Mm -hmm. Well, because then you tee up the people who love you to to come to your pity party, to just join you there, you know, give you a little gift, give you a little something, <laughs> scoop of ice cream or something, and then you move on, right? It lifts it. It's radically different to say, I'm feeling sorry for myself versus outlining all of the ways in which people don't appreciate you, people don't treat you fairly. It's radically different. It's subtle, but it's a difference that makes all the difference. And by the way, I love that your son has got, I mean, I love... Like what a blessing that he gets to, ha- he gets that, you know, at his young age that he gets it and he's practicing it with you. So cool. Okay. So let us talk about slow. So in your book, and I, you know, I think this is really, I think we've, we've touched on all of these elements, but I, I do want you to just talk us through these four, the, the slow process, the C label, open, welcome. That's the process of starting to get a grip on noticing when we are ruminating and making shifts from thinking about to being with. Yeah. Understanding when to do this is almost the hardest part, you know? And so I would just encourage people to pay attention to their their bodies, pay attention to moments when you feel, you know, constricted or tight, or when you notice that your mind is kind of checking out or you're detaching or distancing or you're irritable. And in that moment, you know, in in any moment when you feel uncomfortable or unsafe with your partner, and of course there's no real danger here, but just this kind of your your nervous system is having a, a reactive response that's a moment when you can practice the first step of slow, which is just seeing, you know, seeing, using your awareness to focus in on what's happening in your mind and ask yourself, what am I thinking? You know, and just that three or four seconds of paying attention to your thoughts has the potential to allow you to notice, oh, okay, I'm thinking I'm scared or I'm thinking judgmental thoughts about my partner, you know, or I'm feeling a lot of self-pity or, wow, I'm starting to worry about this thing that's not happening for two weeks, but it's, you know, it's starting to take over my mind. So seeing is just that, that moment when you sort of refocus your awareness from the external world into your own internal 
mental cognitive experience. And labeling is kind of blends in with seeing, but labeling is when you can name the rumination cycle that you're in and just recognize, is it control, worry, self-pity, blame, or doubt? And then from there, you can move into getting under what you're thinking, which is opening. So in that moment, you breathe, you connect to your sensations, and you just open to being with whatever is happening under the layer of thinking. And you'll often find that there's some vulnerable experience happening there that you can connect with. And then the final step is is welcoming. And that's just welcoming whatever you're, you're experiencing. So whatever you're feeling, saying, okay, I welcome this. I'm not pushing this away. I am not judging it. I'm not overthinking. I'm just going to welcome what I'm feeling. All right. So let's take all of that and see what we can offer to Sammy. So our listener question is from Sammy, who is in Westminster, Colorado. Her pronouns are she, her. And she writes, hello, I live with my partner of almost three years. I also lived with my last long-term partner in college. I told myself the narrative that my last partner and I were not a match because toward the end of the relationship, his jokes annoyed me, his constructive criticism annoyed me, I didn't want to be intimate, and I felt suffocated. However, on paper, he was always what I said I wanted. He was loyal, driven, dedicated to family, and we shared a love of physical fitness. About a year later, I met my current partner, who is the opposite in a lot of ways. He doesn't take life or fitness too seriously. He's funny. He had been through a lot of emotional and physical abuse in childhood that affected finishing college and his belief in being able to have a successful career. Now I'm feeling a lot of the same feelings I was toward the end of my last relationship, except for the lack of intimacy. And they make me want to A, run, and B, seriously consider if I ended things for the wrong reasons in my last relationship. Help. So, Alicia, what stands out to you most about this question? What what are you interested in in us offering to Sammy? Mm. I'm impressed by Sammy's self awareness. Just yeah, just being able to see that you have created this narrative in the past, you know, and that you're also noticing that there's a pattern going on here. That is already your not blaming your partner or your past partners. You know, you're recognizing that you have an impact on what's going on here. Once Sammy is able to notice that these are two different partners, she's had the experience of being with multiple people, and yet she is still having the same reaction of, there's something wrong here. Maybe they're not the right person for me in it self-doubt rumination cycle. You know, did I make a mistake by leaving my old partner? There's that opportunity to practice slow macro, micro level to begin looking at what are the patterns here. Recognizing those patterns then allow, well, you know, can allow Sammy to ask questions and do that, that inquiry that you were talking about, Alexandra, of wondering, you know, what am I scared of here? You know, um, what am I feeling when I get closer to somebody? What's going on within me or what have I experienced in the past in terms of safety or danger when it comes to needing somebody and relying on somebody that might be influencing my own overthinking about whatever partners I'm with? Mm Mm-hmm. I I chose we we chose this question you know to work on with you for precisely that reason is that you know I think this like this kind of like partner A versus partner B is something that that just comes up all of the time in my work and it's one of the inevitable complexities of having lived multiple love stories is that you do you can you can sit there and map out what this partner was like versus this one versus this one. And it can be very seductive. It's a very seductive overthinking trap, right? To imagine that my job, my relational goal is to just pick a partner where I'm not going to have to experience 
this ick. And so Sam, I mean, there's so much courage in what Sammy is doing here because it's like she's, like you were saying, like she's got it. You know, she's got a lot of this. She's onto herself a bit, knowing that there's something going on by kind of comparing partner A to partner B. And of course, like Esther Perel says, like when we choose a partner, we choose a story. So she had a story with partner A and she decided at a point in time that story was not sustainable. She was not able to live within that story. And now she's with this new partner. And of course, there are challenges in this relationship because there's going to be challenges in every relationship. And this new partner is giving her, she has a chance to practice perhaps something in this relationship that she couldn't practice in her last relationship, which is this process of slow, which is getting curious about what's underneath these feelings, which by the way, are quite, I mean, there's not a feeling she listed here that I don't relate to after 25 years of marriage. Suffocation, got that. Struggles with intimacy, check, you know, <laughs> annoyed by my partner's whatever, check, check, check. So these, there's nothing that stands out about her concerns as glaring, you know, questions about the viability of a relationship. These are normative relational concerns. We're always navigating like closeness versus distance, more versus less, you know, to what degree can I stand up for myself versus lean into you? These are really just like perennial relational dynamics. But what she has now is a chance to work within herself. And all of the that slow process, I think, will help you, Sammy, get to some little sneaky knots that are underneath that may have to do with, well, very likely have to do with family of origin, what you weren't able to ask for when you were little that you need to ask for now, or you get to ask for now in your relationship. And so that process of starting to notice the way in which your rumination, your rumination has, has the risk of putting you on the side road that's not going to be as fruitful right? Because the rumination for her is all this kind of doubt and worry and comparison of A versus B that's maybe taking her away from something that is just so tender and real and central inside of her. Yes. And it takes a lot of courage to even be at the point where she's at, where, you know, she's seeing her tendency to compare, you know, she's noticing that the the common denominator in these relationships is her you know, and from that point of having accrued some of these experiences of of annoyance, dissatisfaction with her partners, you know, the way intimacy can collapse seemingly mysteriously in committed relationships, it also puts her at this crossroads where she can start to question the cultural expectations that were sort of you know, force fed about what love can give us and what love can realistically offer us. And that huge cultural narrative that, you know, another person will make you happy, you know, and a relationship will satisfy you. And a good relationship, you know, makes you feel good. Like those things are simply not true. I mean, yes, there are moments that you feel good, you feel happy, they satisfy you. You also should not be in a torturous, painful relationship that's endlessly creating misery for you. But, you know, our I, I like to think of our partners more as, rather than people who are there to make us happy, they're people who are there to help elicit our unfinished business. So Sammy is with these, she's with a new person who is kicking up her unfinished business and she's poised to look at her contribution and grow. Yeah. Oh, it's so hopeful. It's so hopeful. There's so much hope in that because you're you're inviting her to start from a different place than did you or did you not make a mistake? That's not a very interesting place to start. The more interesting question is, okay, what is this man <laughs> kicking up? What What is the opportunity here in the context of this relationship for me to tend to within myself? Thank you. Sammy, we're sending you big love. Thank you so much for writing that question because I think that it speaks to, I think your your question is many, many people's question. So Alicia, I'm going to bring us to a close. I would love for you to talk just a bit about how else, how people can get to know you and your work more deeply and connect with you. We will, of course, 
put links in the show notes to Stop Overthinking Your Relationship, which is a wonderful book and available where all the books are sold. Mm, right? Yeah. I would just uh, invite people to follow me on Instagram and check out Psychotherapy Networker. Get a subscription if you like to read. I write frequent articles there and also get the book. You can look on my website if you'd like to join one of my free courses. It's www.aliciamunoz.com. My Instagram is at Alicia Munoz Couples. Yeah. You know, not everybody who listens to the show is a therapist, but there are lots of therapists who listen to the show. And, you know, if you are a therapist and you're listening and you feel like you haven't quite found your professional home, I cannot talk more highly about Psychotherapy Network. I mean, we already sang the praises at the beginning, but really it is my it is my favorite conference every year. It's a magazine. I mean, I was my first year of my PhD program and my professor, Vicki Seglin, was like, you all need to get this magazine. It was at that time it was called Family Therapy Networker. I got my subscription for Christmas, my first year of grad school, and I have never stopped subscribing to the magazine. It is my favorite magazine, my favorite conference. You know, I, I, my, the book I'm working on right now is with PESI. So PESI and Psychotherapy Networker are, you know, partnered together. I've created a course through PESI. Like I'm just, I'm here for all of the things. There's so much integrity and goodness in the team there. And now that they've snatched you up, I mean, sky's the limit, you know, like, here we go, here we go. So it's a wonderful, wonderful community. Mm, thank you for that plug. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Alicia. Thanks so much, Alexandra. Thank you, Alicia, for diving into this crucial topic. Alicia's book, Stop Overthinking Your Relationship, Break the Cycle of Anxious Rumination to Nurture Love, Trust, and Connection with Your Partner is magnificent. And if this conversation landed for you at all, which I'm sure it did, I really recommend that you pick up a copy. That link is in the show notes. Okay, until next time, be well. Thank you for listening to our show. Our producer is Elizabeth Vogt. Our editors are Mary Chan and Katie Pagich of Organized Sound Productions. Our theme music was composed by Slade Warnkin. Reimagining Love is executive produced by me, Dr. Alexandra Solomon. Do you have a relationship question that you want answered on the show? Visit reimagininglove.com to send in a written or audio question. Questions can be about intimate partnerships, family relationships, friendships, you name it. If you're looking for more love and relationship content, you can find me on Instagram at dr.alexandra.solomon or visit my website, dralexandrasolomon.com, where you'll find my blog as well as the Intimate Relationships 101 e-course based off of the popular class I teach at Northwestern University. Thank you for listening and see you next week here on Reimagining Love. <laughs>